Good evening. I'd like to call this February 28th, 2023 school board work session, budget work session number three, and adoption of FY24 school board advertised budget meeting to order. Ms. Goodell, could you please call the roll? Yes. Dr. Anderson? Here. Ms. Ad Ms. Downs? Here. Dr. Gould? Here. Dr. Ortiz? Here. Ms. Silverman? Here. And Ms. Tice? Here. Thank you. Thank you. If you could join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could have a motion to adopt the agenda, please. I move to, to adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Silverman. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. We're now at 2.01 overview of an advanced academic plan, and I will turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Chair Downs, and good evening, board members. Um, just to be super clear about what this work session is about, um, to ensure that there's no confusion about the name. It's actually the overview of the advanced academic program at Oak Street Elementary School. So I wanna make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, I have um, some thoughts that I'd like to share at the beginning of the um, conversation this evening. Um, I've actually written them down so that I don't lose my place and uh, don't get talking like I do sometimes. But if you'll bear with me, I'd appreciate the opportunity to sort of share a little bit of context. Um, so, so first of all, first and foremost, we're super pleased to be here tonight to speak about the Advanced Academic Program, um, also referred to as Gifted and Talented at Oak Street Elementary. Um, as it is, has existed in the past, how it exists today, and how we envision it existing in the future. Um, as we head into the discussion tonight, um, I'd really like to take some time to frame the discussion for you and for the community. And I know that there are some folks listening online and some folks are here tonight and we welcome them. So let me, let me just start with past years, uh, just for a little historical context. Over the past several years, there have been a variety of models to support uh, GT students at Oak Street Elementary. For example, prior to COVID closures, level two students, identified level two students, were pulled out once per week per identification um, which in some cases was up to eight times per month. Additionally, level two students that were identified were also in what, we were, what was then called ACE Tiger Paws, um, which was as many as four mornings a week uh, of differentiated instruction with their academic peers, led by a general education teacher and supported by the gifted and talented teacher. Neither of those have happened with fidelity post COVID. Um, post COVID, the model has provided some pullout services for our identified gifted students with a GT teacher. Our level one students were accessing some services with the GT teacher during Tiger Paws last year, and the level two students were pulled out, in most cases, at least four times a month for differentiated services with a GT teacher. To be clear, the model of support for GT identified students has changed from year to year for a variety of reasons to include, first and foremost, pandemic recovery efforts. Current year, so let me fast forward to this year. In the past year, Oak Street Elementary has experienced a change in leadership and staffing that coincided with some previously planned programmatic changes to the GT program that were not communicated uh, with the precision necessary for our community or for our staff. Some parents were left to wonder, why is this happening? We understand this programmatic transition needed more discussion. We own the lack of communication and regret that it happened on the, didn't happen on the front end. But in an effort to mitigate the issues raised, we, we did make some changes for some identified GT students. So let me get into the weeds just a little bit here to, to provide some clarity. In an attempt to increase the pullout time for our level two students, extra time on short Wednesdays was added to the two pullout days and the two encore days with the GT teacher. In the end, the students who are identified as level two this year are actually seeing the GT teacher more this year than they did in the past last year. However, that being said, it is a model change 
So it looks and feels different to our parents and they perceive this as a loss of service. And we understand that concern and we've heard that concern. Because the school schedule at Oak Street is very complex and complicated and has many moving pieces we, uh, that, that impact across the entire site, the short of it is that this model of service is not likely to change for the level two students for the remainder of this year. Students will continue to get two days of pullout, two days of encore rotation, and additional time on half day Wednesdays. However, tonight, you'll hear how next year identified students will return to four days of pullout, at least four days of pullout for small group instruction. As for our level one students, their services were also impacted due to the changes in Tiger Paws. This was the identified venue where students would be receiving differentiated instruction from a GT teacher. These changes are not in line with our stated commitments and are not in alignment with our, our local plan for the gifted. Tonight, you'll hear from Ms. Doherty, our great principal at Oak Street Elementary, how this will be remedied for the remainder of the year and for the future. So future years, and, and let me just start with a quick story. Um, when I became the, the Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Services or Chief Academic Officer in Fairfax County Public Schools some 15 years ago, um, I had a conversation with the then middle school director. And I said to the middle school director, uh, we, we were in this conversation about summer school. And I said to the middle school director, what materials and resources do we use for summer school? And she gave me the long list of materials and said, these summer school materials are awesome. They always get our kids from where they are to grade level. And I said, where are those resources? And she said, they're in the warehouse. I didn't know I inherited a warehouse when I became the assistant superintendent for instruction in Fairfax County. And I said, well, why aren't they being implemented in the regular year? And she said, well, then we'd have to cancel summer school. <laughs> and so the, the, it's, it's an insane story, right? So the idea is, and there's an analog here, that we shouldn't in good conscience reserve those materials that we know work for one purpose or another. We should be implementing instructional programming to support all of our kids during the school year. Um, and that makes for good, good best practices. So right, wrong, or indifferent, um, whether, whether we believe it or not, and I, I believe it just in the, the years that I've had in my experience, schools generally have a history of reserving some, some materials and some supplies for certain kids. And in this particular circumstance over summer school, it was my goal to get those materials and resources out of the warehouse and get them to kids. And so our goal here is very analogous to that story. And it is to provide the most rigorous materials and instructional practices for more students at Oak Street Elementary and not hold them in reserve like the summer school materials had been. What's best practice for our advanced academic learners or our GT students is best practice for all of our kids. So some examples of some things that have been traditionally reserved across systems, Socratic seminars, De Bono's thinking caps, critical and creative thinking skills lessons, William and Mary units of study, as students get older, document-based questions. These are all things that we know work with our advanced academic learners, but we should be applying those in all of our classrooms because all of our kids can meet a high expectation when we set it with the appropriate amount of scaffolding and structure. So um, an author that I admire a lot, whose name is Barbara Blackburn, brings light to this idea and has put her thoughts into a set of critical statements for consideration. And she, she calls these the seven myths of rigor. And Blackburn says, it, it, these myths um, are in place and they often perpetuate the status quo and ultimately keep systems from moving forward to provide deeper levels of thinking and learning for all students. So here are the seven myths and I just share them with you for consideration. First is lots of homework is a sign of rigor. I think we would all agree that more homework is not a sign of rigor. Although many of our parents will say, my kids aren't getting homework. The class must not be very hard. Well, it's different, right? It's about how you approach that work. And the second is rigor means doing more work. So in other words, you're done with your assignment, I'm gonna give you something else to do. And the more you do, the more rigorous it is. And that's absolutely not the case. The third is that rigor is not for everyone. That myth is debunked all over the place when we know that when we provide students opportunities, they'll meet it. The fourth is providing support means lessening rigor. We know that our students that are special needs students, our students that are ESOL students, our kids that are not identified as GT or advanced academics, 
with the appropriate scaffolding can meet a benchmark that we set for them that can be often very rigorous. Um, resources equal rigor. In other words, if we give these particular resources, they equate to a rigorous instructional program. And we know that that's not true. Um, some resources are good, some resources are, resources are not good. Standards alone take care of resource, uh, take care of rigor. You've heard from the state of Virginia that our Virginia standards of learning are the most rigorous standards in the country. That's what the Virginia Department of Education will, will argue. And the truth of it is, is I can teach a standard one way that's rigorous, or I can teach a standard another way that's not rigorous. So it doesn't matter what the standard is, it's how you approach the work. And lastly, rigor is just one more thing to do, that in some ways, some people interpret providing a, a level of rigor with depth and complexity for students is in some ways um, one more thing that they have to do, and that, that is truly a myth. So I want to focus on um, question or on those three and four in particular. So three was, you know, rigor isn't for everyone, and four is providing support means lessening rigor. Rigor is for everybody, and providing support is how we achieve it. Rigor in the end is how we approach our work in curriculum instruction and in student engagement. I, I believe, we believe, um, we as, a, as an instructional team believe that we must expand opportunities for all students and it's a matter of equity and it's in alignment to the school board's equity policy. Furthermore, in our core values that were adopted as part of the strategic plan, we wrote in there, we will hold students at the center of our purpose, culture, learning and environment, will empower students to achieve success through high quality teaching and learning and the last core commitment is we will actively work to remove systematic barriers to equity in our schools, interrogate and dismantle policies and practices that are at the root of inequity and provide adults the training they need to foster inclusive learning environments. So tonight, Ms. Doherty is gonna share with you her vision for the future of, for not only identified advanced academic students at Oak Street, but also for all students at Oak Street in an effort to break down the barriers and put teeth into the expression that we often use of all means all. So tonight, we are making an adjustment to the budget that we've shared with you, and that is in the budget motion, and there's a full 1.0 teacher position in the budget that we hope that you'll adopt as your advertised budget this evening that will be assigned full-time to Oak Street Elementary to work with identified gifted students and to support the work of expanding access through model lessons and supporting teachers as they earn their endorsement in gifted and talented education. Ms. Doherty's leadership around this work has been greatly appreciated and many in her, on her staff are already excited about the future of where we're headed. When we raise the bar and level up, our students can achieve. Many of our staff at Oak Street are experts in scaffolding learning, differentiating instruction and supporting students to achieve their fullest potential. Further, for those that need extra help, and we know that there are, we will support them and we'll also support our staff, not only with PD from our experts on the team in FCCPS, but through getting more teachers at Oak Street formally endorsed and gifted and talented through university coursework to support this vision for the future. We are privileged as a school division. On the FCCPS team, we have those that have not only implemented advanced academic programs, but also worked in them and are intimately familiar with how they run and work well. We have a plan that supports learning for our students and for our teachers. In the end, learning of the change in programming and working with our amazing team to reconfigure our approach, we've determined that we can offer going forward, uh, to, we, can, we can and will offer something going forward that will meet the needs of all of our learners and be more equitable than we have been in the past, truly opening access through a both and, so it's, the, the, it's not the tyranny of or, but the beauty of and, approach. This discussion will continue with the GAC committee and their work to revise the local plan for the gifted will continue. We did propose postponing the presentation to the school board until later in the year so that the staff could share, uh, so we as a staff could share with you the direction that we're taking with the expansion of services. I'd like to publicly thank the GAC for volunteering their time to help us be clear about the direction we're moving and support us as a system as we do. Finally, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to clarify the programming changes that have happened and what we envision happening at Oak Street Elementary. Advanced academic instruction is an operational and instructional decision that is facilitated by the school board's governance responsibility, primarily the budget.
process in this case, which you're doing tonight. I am aware of the email traffic that you've received over the past couple of months, and I want to clarify for the community that the board has the responsibility for the budget, and we as a staff are responsible for the implementation of the program. To that end, if there are concerns regarding the programming in our schools now and into the future, I would encourage our community to share those with the principal, our chief academic officer, and me, as, again, we are responsible for, responsible for the implementation of programming. All of us value the input we receive from our parents and look forward to hearing from you. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Ms. Doherty um, to take it away, who will introduce uh, Morgan, who's with us today. And I also want to thank Julie Macrina, who's back there, Peter Weilandman, who is with us, and thank William Bates for his work on this presentation as well. So Ms. Doherty. There we go. Are we going, who's uh, manning the slides? Okay, you will, thank you. Will you take us to our current levels of service? So keep going, keep going, keep going. There we go, thank you. Um, so first we're gonna look at what's currently happening this year. Um, so right now we have uh, the differentiated instruction in classroom settings, access to rigorous tasks provided by our advanced academic specialist, the enrichment instruction during a week, um, the fourth and fifth graders who receive uh, advanced math receive push-in services by um, the advanced academic specialist during B week. And then starting this spring, we have found an advanced academics resource teacher, an advanced academics teacher who will come in and provide additional small group support for, um, for our level one uh, students. And then uh, our level two students receive differentiated instruction in classroom settings, enrichment instruction during A week. Uh, third grade receives small group pullout for language arts and math during B week. Fourth and fifth grade receives small group uh, pullout for language arts and push in for math during uh, B week. And then during that rotating short Wednesday schedule, uh, they're receiving an additional 30 minutes. So that's current. I think we all agree we want more. So um, if we look forward, before we get to where we're going, um, currently these are our numbers. So um, let me move my little clip right here because it's covering my numbers. So in third grade, currently we have a total of 44 students who are identified as gifted. Uh, 25 level two math, 14 level one math, 25 level two English, seven level one English. Fourth graders, a total of 33 students are currently identified as gifted. 25 level two math, four level one math, 13 level two English, five level one English. Our fifth graders, we have a total of 38. Uh, 16 level two math, 14 level one math, uh, 14 level two English, eight level one English. So looking to the future. I want to reestablish and maintain what has been known with having one advanced academic resource teacher who is able to provide some push in services, but a great deal of small group pull out. And um, so we'll do that. We'll reestablish what's been known, what's been embraced, what has supported. But then we're also going to look at this additional 1.0 that's going to support us because we're going to look at clustering, just like we cluster in order to target needs of students. We're going to cluster our students who are identified as gifted across um, three classrooms. I've already talked to the teams. They're excited about the fa fact that we're facilitating and encouraging additional pathways to get their gifted endorsement or certification. And um, currently endorsement, but I'd love to see if we can get a certification too, which we've got Morgan working on that. Um, and so we'll have, so we'll have these three classrooms in each of the three grade levels to start. That's only the beginning because ideally I would like to have everyone at Oak Street endorsed and gifted services. Just stop and imagine that. An IB school division, full IB implementation at Oak Street, on top of that, all teachers gifted in that, uh, endorsed in the gifted endorsement so that they also know how to not only implement IB instruction, but also really differentiate for those students who are identified as gifted. 
So then we'll cluster, we'll differentiate instruction, and then we will also provide um, professional development on a regular basis every month. So once a month, we're going to have PYP embedded professional development for every teacher at Oak Street. And monthly, we will also have differentiated professional development, and we're gonna have targeted professional development for these nine teachers. And ideally, we wanna tie it to the instruction they're receiving while they're working on their gifted endorsement. So they're actually gonna get support on their gifted endorsement through the actual PD. They're not gonna get the credit through that PD during our uh, time at school, but they're going to actually continue to work and develop their skill set that they'll actually be studying when they're working on their coursework to get their endorsement. So we'll be supporting with that. So again, really supporting our teachers because if we really want true differentiation, we wanna make sure that we also support our teachers in that development. So that takes us to uh, facilitating these pathways. So we're uh, gonna facilitate access to the certification and or endorsement. Uh, we're going to pay for our teachers to obtain their endorsement and gifted instruction for their Virginia license. Um, Morgan is currently working with local colleges, looking at online platforms like North Tier, also offering to teach North Tier classes. <laughs> um, so we're looking at all of those pieces. And then a perk is that these additional um, graduate credit um, coursework will also, there'll be that potential for that, the positive salary implications for teachers as well. So it's what's best for students, but also we can be a bit of a perk for our teachers as we move forward. I love this visual right here. So by reestablishing what's been known with the one uh, gifted teacher, with the one advanced academics instructor, if we look at that third column, it says access provided by the classroom teacher meets the district expectation of one experience per quarter, may only be in one or two content areas. Some teachers may not understand the rationale for the initiative yet. So that at least provides that third column of emerging implementation. So we're gonna sustain, reestablish, sustain. And it also really kind of blends right between the third and the fourth column, because if you look at that last bullet in the fourth column, it says, well, teachers understand the rationale for the initiative. So we're kind of in the middle there, depending on the teacher knowledge, which is why we're looking forward to facilitating their endorsement. What we're moving towards is all the way to the end. We're gonna move all the way to the fifth column. We're gonna, act, we're gonna provide access frequently provided by the classroom teachers across the school. Access is a frequent part of team planning cycles in all content areas. The teachers believe in the importance of access as an equity mission of the school, and teachers and teams are fluent, and that is a critical piece, that all teachers and teams are fluent in the language of deeper learning instruction, as well as the assessment for growth and learner skills. So that is where we're going at Oak Street, and I'm really excited about it. And now I'm going to uh, let Morgan sure. take where we're going and talk about the professional development and how we're going to get there. And if you think of her last name, just think of <laughs> Ocutio. <laughs> so this is Morgan Ocutio, yes. our coordinator for gifted instruction. Thank you. I noticed Dr. Noonan didn't pronounce my last name because it is it is tricky. Uh, I was is, hoping you didn't pick up on that. I, I did. I did. I, I usually do. Um, but my thank you, Kareem. My name is Morgan Ocutio. And um, I'm going to share with you a little bit more about um, what we've been working on this year. So, um, and adding to what Kareem shared with the levels of deeper learning and that graphic up there, I think when you think about deeper learning, it occurs when individuals and specialists, when it, across a building, have a common language and a sustained belief in the importance of equity and the opportunity for everyone. Um, the question is, how do we build it? Um, how do we how do we start? And as Kareem mentioned, it's it's coaching. It's building that capacity in our teachers and our educators to to dive into these these deeper, rich tasks for students. And we're work, we're working toward that. Um, so it's higher order thinking. It's rich math tasks. It's critical and creative thinking that's already embedded in the IB framework. And that graphic with the umbrella and IB is a great illustration of those higher order thinking skills that we're we're working toward building capacity and with our teachers. Um, some of the things that we, we've been working on this year, and um, one of the things is just meeting on a very weekly, ba um, 
pretty much a weekly basis with our administrative team. So I've been working with our administrative teams to support them and support our teachers to look at the academic needs within our buildings, and specifically at Oak Street. Um, we meet on a weekly basis, um, Kareem and our PYP coordinator and I. So looking at how all of those things are embedded together to level up learning for all kids using a continuum of services model. Um, so again, providing resources to the teachers using differentiated frameworks. Um, there's a lot of a lot of work that's going on behind the scenes with the intranet and providing uh, levels of service and curriculum frameworks for teachers to utilize to engage in higher level and order or thinking skills and best practices. We've um, done a lot of professional development or PD uh, within Oak Street. We looked specifically at a needs assessment that the teachers filled out. And when we planned for that professional development, we took into account what the teachers wanted to, to engage further in learning. Um, we, I'm also working with Oak Street specifically on the intake process when students are coming new to the district. So when kids are coming new to the district, they come with a cumulative file. And in that cumulative file is a record of service. Or if, if they've had services in another district, there might be also a, t a test scores. So working with, with Peter, working with, um, with Oak Street in general to make sure that we're, we're catching kids as they come in and also um, assessing those kids. So making sure that we, we give them the assessment um, as part of the process. And, I, and I've taken con the lead on that at Oak Street. Um, another thing that we've been working on is our screening with, with second graders coming up to third grade. So there's a lot of data points that we need to collect for that. And I've been working toward that. Um, and then I've been exploring a lot of pathways with VDOE, as Kareem kind of mentioned, um, in terms of how do we, we provide an endorsement process for our teachers that we can support here in Falls Church and that we can um, make a, a manageable um, uh, undertaking for our, our teachers, knowing that their time is, is valuable and the coursework takes a lot of time to complete. So, so I've been working with the Virginia Department of Ed to make sure that we, we, we explore all of the pathways that we can. Um, so differentiation in, in FCPS, I think it's important to consider that when we differentiate, um, we have to consider individuals' interests, readiness, learning profiles in context of the larger group. So when we change the learn, we can, we can change their learning environment, the content and our instructional plan. And as Dr. Noonan mentioned, there are so many great best practices that we've started to embed using different types of um, le lessons within our collaborative team meetings at Oak Street. And um, some of those are the William and Mary units. Um, Jacob's Ladder is a phenomenal curriculum unit of study where you, you challenge kids to synthesize and analyze texts at a much deeper level. And that's, in, that's embedded in what, what the best practices that we're trying to accomplish. And then rich math tasks as well. Um, so some of those rich math tasks, when I say rich math tasks, what, what I'm saying, what I'm speaking to are those tasks that get kids thinking about how, mani how to manipulate numbers. Um, and we're working toward that as well. And I, I, the last slide is a multifaceted model in action. When we think about the profile of a gifted learner, I, giftedness is multifaceted. And the work of Sally Reese and Joe Renzoli from the University of Connecticut is, is um, very, very important when we think about the multi multifaceted nature of giftedness. It, giftedness, when you, look at, when you look at the profile of a gifted learner, you look at above average ability, you can look at the creative creativity aspect and task commitment. And a lot of the times I think kids are strong in one area and maybe not so strong in another. And that's what I mean by multifaceted. And when we look at best practices in gifted education, that continuum of service model is highlighted in that graphic up there um, because we're, we're meeting the kids where they're at and, and leveling up learning for all kids at, at where they're at. Um, the talent development idea in, in the graphic, again, this comes from the work of Reese and Renzulli. Um, the talent development model is something that we work on very well at, in, our, in our primary grades, and that's also embedded in the work in Oak Street that the kids are engaged in. Um, talent development creates a system to support student potential and to actualize talent through rigorous learning experiences. 
and um, I, it's, I'm trying to read it, but I'm trying to, okay, there we go. Um, so again, just providing that broad range of experiences for students, for anything from um, language rich curricular tasks to problem solving tasks in math. And then um, cluster grouping, and, and Kareem mentioned this as well, cluster grouping based on abilities and interests. And this all flows into a continuum of service model when it comes to best practices and gifted education. So then if we look at having two full-time advanced academics teachers, here's how I see the use. One, whoops. I thought it was loud enough. Okay, so here's how I see the implementation of two advanced academic resource teachers at Oak Street. One, we'll reestablish and provide what we've known of small group pull out, some, pull, some push in. The other one will provide the biweekly enrichment where we're differentiating for all. I also really want this teacher to look at starting to um, identify gifted opportunities and traits in all our learners and I really want them to create a portfolio for every single one of our students at Oak Street so that we have evidence that we can talk about for every single child at Oak Street okay so that will be every other week then every other week they're going to go into the classrooms those nine classrooms we've identified they're going to go in they're going to model they're going to coach and they're going to further differentiate for the students in those classes and so that's how we're getting to the end of that graphic where we're providing for all our students and we're truly differentiating for our students who have been identified for gifted instruction so in an effort to summarize and and to um, try to bring some closure to this topic which i know has been on the minds of many for a while um, we we just want to make sure everybody in the community uh, Oak Street community understands that um, next year we are looking at bringing back the pullout services that our community has come to um, uh, understand as part of our gifted and talented educational program or advanced academic program, but we also are going to expand. And I think that's the beauty of having this additional 1.0 is that it gives us an opportunity to expand um, curriculum resources, expand professional development, expand learning for all of our all of our students across um, the grades three through three through five so that when they hit the middle school um, they will they'll be prepared um, because there isn't there isn't the distinction or differentiation of of coursework there like you get at oak street and oak street's unique because it's really the only place where there is any kind of pull out or differentiation like that by the time kids get to middle school they take honors courses and that becomes their differentiated approach. So um, we are, we're very excited about um, the work ahead. Uh, and again, I wanna just reiterate something that, that um, Ms. Doherty said, and that is that this is just the beginning um, of, a, of a long range plan to be able to provide for all of our teachers the opportunity to be trained in um, and work with our kids uh, through the lens of an advanced academic uh, program. So. With that, we um, welcome any questions that you have uh, and we'll end there. Thanks. Thank you so much everyone for the presentation and uh, Dr. Nooner appreciated your words in the beginning. I think gave us some great context to frame this conversation and thank you both for the presentation. Uh, who would like to kick us off? Yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you, Dr. Noonan and uh, Ms. Doherty and Morgan <laughs> <laughs> for the great presentation. Um, few questions um what was the teacher's response when you mentioned this to them were they thinking oh my god another task i have to fulfill or were they excited about it i know they're i'm happy to hear one of my questions to you which i scratched out was will there be a pay raise um, upon completion um so that's great that that work will be recognized but what was their response so thanks for asking because um you know as you know this is my first year and i'm just starting to, to connect with and get to know every single staff member. And so I was excited about this. And um, as I've gotten to know teachers, I thought, I think this one will be excited. And I think this one, I, I met with each group of grade level teachers and we've had a conversation all year. We've had repeated conversations about how can we improve upon our uh, services for all of our students across the board and how can we be look at how we're going to rearrange maybe some class assignments so that we're really providing as much support for all of our students 
And so that's where the conversation began. And, um, and I talked to them about how we've been working to facilitate their endorsement and how wonderful IB instruction was and we need to really bring it back and, and re-inject it because you know the pandemic kind of interrupted a little bit about that. And I said, but we're gonna add more to that. We're gonna also um, turn us into a school where we can write a book together about how we were a fully embedded IB school as well as able to differentiate for all of our students in advanced academics. They all joined in and they all started asking questions and said, well, one of them said, I have the endorsement. I said, I looked at your endorsement. It's not on your license. <laughs> and so she's already working on it, <laughs> getting it added to her license. Um, she went through VA and for some reason hadn't uh, submitted it. And then others uh, said, oh, I already took a class or two through North Tier. Can I continue and then add there? And I said, that's what we're working on. So it was just a great conversation about who was interested and um, some of them said, oh, I, I think I'd like, to, I'm interested, but let me look into it and see if I wanna be the first rollout uh, to get endorsed in, in this, or if I wanna let one of my other teammates do it and I'll do it next, because again, they understand this is the beginning and we're looking at everyone getting endorsed eventually. Um, they, they were wonderful. They just, they followed up. Um, they showed excitement when I shared it with teams and they followed up with text messages and some emails and some stopped by my classroom. And I mean, they really, I'm enjoying working at Oak Street and getting to know our teachers. They truly just want to do what's best for the kids, but it's really important that while they do what's best for the kids, that I do what's best for them as well. And that I schedule out the professional development. I let them know in advance. I've already got the dates, by the way, if you want them. I just don't have them here because I want to put them on the calendar so they know the dates first. Um, so they're excited about the professional development. They love IB, right? And so they're really excited of making sure that we are re-energizing our instruction in IB because we did hire some new teachers over the pandemic. And as much as they've been learning with our fabulous Carrie Cheka, we know that in-person professional development is really the best and engaging with each other. So we're gonna go back to that. And, um, and they're excited about um, the differentiated professional development. I was actually a little bit worried about that. And I thought, oh gosh, I hope some of them don't think how come they get that professional development and we don't, but it, there was none of that. They understood how important it was to kind of create that cohort and have that support and that they too will have their turn as well. And, and so you already have the professional development days planned out? Of course. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, <laughs> second, Chair, if you don't mind if I have a few please, questions, please. thank you. Um, is this so, th this 1.0 that we're considering tonight, is that a one-time fee fund or is this a continuing fund? This is this money would be coming out of one-time funding. So w where is it coming from? Um, Ms. Michael, you wanna answer that one? We have a number of uh, one-time fund pots, so I wanna make sure we get it right. So we had included in the superintendent's proposed budget that we would be using our one-time federal funding to expand um, the physician by a half. And then the additional half included in the advertised motion from tonight is one-time funding that we previously had set aside for textbook funding, um, but we're recommending that we redirect it to make this um, advanced academics position full-time for next year. So just to play devil's advocate for a moment, um, do we not need the textbook funding? Is it okay to progress, to push that off for a year? What, what's the status of that? So we have textbook funding in our base budget and we had um, included in the proposed budget adding an additional 100,000 in one-time funding to that textbook adoption budget to give us the ability to purchase more, a greater volume of textbooks. Um, as we work to conclude this budget process and get to May, um, we will get updates in terms of funding both from the state and our general government. And at that point, if we have additional funding, the board could reconsider putting funding back into the textbook adoption at that point if we wanna continue with that path. I, I, well, I guess my question though is, do we not need those textbooks this year? You know, what, what if we don't find that additional funding? Um, I, I don't I don't know what these I, textbooks I think, are. Yeah, I think we'll be okay. We, we had a long conversation internally about it, and we think that, um, one, I think we're gonna be okay financially if we do wanna put the money back, but if it doesn't come back, um, it looks like some of the resources that may be adopted may be, may be less expensive than we anticipated. 
okay, I just don't want this to be that we're funding this 1.0 instead of a 0 0.5, but then it's a detriment to other students it and what, what they're missing out on. So thank you for that clarification. Um, and I think finally, um, oh, I, I guess, sorry, two more things. Um, so this is funded for one year. Um, um, why, why is it not necessary to fund it for more than one year or are we looking to fund it um, it could be funded for a second year. It could be funded for a number of years, but it would need to be funded out of one-time money um, until until we have the budget to put it into a recurring um, cost okay. cycle. Okay. But I, but I think anticipate I anticipate based on the model that as we have teachers come online with their advanced academic endorsement after that first year. Um, we may not have a need because we'll have many more teachers with that endorsement at Oak Street and students will be assigned to homeroom classes with teachers that have the advanced academic endorsement. So they'll be with a gifted and talented teacher all day long, not just in a pullout. And, and that makes sense. So the, the need might decrease Correct. once we get more teachers certified. Um, and finally, I just, Dr. Noon, I wanted to thank you for, um, I guess, kind of clarifying the roles between um, what the school board is responsible for and what you and uh, Ms. Doherty and the rest of the, um, the um, staff is responsible for when it comes to operations and what we do as a school board in terms of budgetary um, line items. Um, you know, I would be happy to support this additional 1.0 and, you know, my view on how um, advanced academics is implemented I, is, is somewhat irrelevant because I'm not the expert in that area. So I do look um, to you for guidance and in order to implement whatever you believe is best for the schools. So thanks to both of you for doing that. And I, I look forward to supporting the 1.0. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Ms. Tice. Uh, thank you. I wanted to echo um, uh, Ms. Silverman's thank yous for everyone. I really appreciated the presentation. I um, previously served on the Gifted Education Advisory Committee. Um, and I've had kids in the gifted program at Oak Street since 2015. So I have ridden the waves of, of all of these changes. And so I really appreciate um, Dr. Newton sort of outlining um, how we've gotten to where we are. And um, also, I just wanted to, uh, to also just acknowledge it was a bit of a perfect, perfect storm of changes, right? Nationally, the what's considered best practice has changed over the last however many years in gifted education and our leadership has changed and our teachers have changed and we've been through a pandemic so I think it's important to sort of acknowledge how we got to this point and I just am really grateful for the opportunity to just have an open conversation about it and and I'm excited about where um, where where we're looking to go forward uh, I also because I think of my long history with the, um, with the community of gifted parents, I have spent many hours, as I know many people in this room have also, on this conversation over the last several months. And um, I've read every email that we've gotten and have paid close attention to our public comments. And I just wanted to also make, to make sure that it was clear that I really appreciate that our community was very much in support of equity. Um, so many of our messages were, were, were um, highlighting the, the belief in equity and the excitement for enrichment and the excitement that these enrichment classes are opportunity is an opportunity for access for all of our kids um, for this so that I didn't sense any sort of frustration from the community that how dare you give resources to everyone only for my kid I, and that was heartening to hear that it was again it was the both and can we offer these enrichment services for all of our kids and, and in the name of equity and but also um, acknowledge the social emotional needs of gifted learners and how they suffer when they don't get, like all students, when they don't get what they need, um, they, their mental health suffers and they don't enjoy school. And that's not what anybody wants for any of our kids. So um, I think that moving forward, this, um, this model of all day, every day gifted instruction is really exciting. So I, I wanna stay open-minded um, and I'm encouraging the community to stay open-minded to services not having to look like a pull-out model. I mean, if your kid is getting one hour, pulled out one hour a week and that's the one hour a week that you have made a dentist appointment, then there's their services for the week. Um, that's really frustrating for the kid and for the parent um, when that's the one hour a week they look forward to. So to think about it being an opportunity for them to have all day, every day, like every kid should have access to what they need for their, you know, why we say name and need all day, every day. Um, so I am excited about that as well. I do um, have a couple of questions. Um, I sense, I've been around and, and engaged in this in this topic. I have always 
wanted and never quite been able to access a resource for parents for when you get this letter that says your kid got identified in X, Y, and Z, and and the letter has changed over time and has gotten better over time and clearer over time. But if, if there is a resource available for parents to say, what does that actually mean? Like, what should I expect? What is a reasonable expectation for parents? And if there was somewhere we could point them, whether it's on the website or it's a brochure or something, so when they get this letter that says, then they know what the expectations are. And then I think that would also help communication moving forward so that what parents are expecting is the same as what the, what the schools are planning to offer. So I don't know if that's a, if, if no, a resource exists I get and I don't know, then that's a question if it doesn't exist. So what I'd question. like to do is actually looking at our future plan, which isn't that far into the future. Um, again, we've got the dates. Um, Morgan and I, will work on a letter that more clearly explains to parents so that when they find out that their students have been identified, parents will have a better understanding of what that means at Oak Street and also, of course, that they can reach out and contact us as well. And what Kareem doesn't know is I've already drafted one. So in the draft form that we've been working on. She's drafted one and I'm not surprised. She probably put my name on it already not too, yet. but it's okay. We're good. We'll have it. It makes perfect sense. That's we'll wonderful. It. I think that would go a long way to sort of easing the, the miscommunications too, and then everyone is expecting the same thing. Additionally, the teacher I haven't hired yet, because um, you have to vote, um, will also be working on a new newsletter. So I want to make sure that we are able to communicate exactly what gifted instruction means at Oak Street, and so then that way um, this teacher that will be seeing everyone uh, through enrichment and then pushing into the classrooms, um, that she'll be able to share more information about that. Because I think as parents, we want to know, well, what do we ask our child? Because otherwise they come home, what'd you do today? Nothing. Great, so glad you did nothing. Um, so this way you're able to ask those great questions about what they really did do and how is that different and, and what units are they studying? And also to find out, well, what's also happening in the small group? Pull out as well. So we'll want to make sure that we really beef up that level of communication as well. And the fabulous thing is that I won't be the new principal at Oak Street anymore. So I'll also be able to tell you all the great things that are going on too. That's great. Thank you so much. I have one more question, if that's okay. Um, for uh, not just for for those of us in the room who are, are more, maybe might be more familiar with the concept, but when we talk about differentiation, um, it can mean a whole lot of things, and it can also mean nothing, depending on how well it's actually implemented. Right? It can be wonderful, or it can just be a buzzword. So, um, I guess if you could kind of expand upon what what um, what differentiation should look like, and what parents and students should be able to expect um, when we say that we're um, because we're really putting more of the expectation on the classroom teachers with this new model that we're looking towards, or even um, with the gifted teacher pushing into the classroom um, of, of, of a, a clustered classroom, but it's still going to be heterogeneous as opposed to a, a pullout, right? It's not like everyone in the room will be identified um, gifted. So there will still be more levels of differentiation than in a pullout experience, right? So um, if you could kind of expand on what, what should and could be expected by parents or, or kids to kind of know what what we're, what we're aiming for, or how to hold, Absolutely. How to hold people So accountable. I can tell you what I'll be looking for. And this is just one quick and easy when I walk in the classroom, what I'll be looking for. And there are various types of differentiation, but one thing I'm going to look for the moment I walk in the classroom is small group targeted instruction. So when you're differentiating, you're accessing different resources. You're either scaffolding up for the students who need some scaffolds to get to where we want everyone to go. You're also differentiating with Williams and Mary units. Uh, Jacob's Ladder, uh, Critical and Creative Thinking Lessons, although I really want that done with absolutely everyone. But um, I'm looking to see, are they? what are they doing differently for each small group that they're working with? And for instance, when uh, this uh, additional advanced academics teacher is in there, um, I'm going to look to see, is are they co-teaching a focus lesson that is the greater topic for all? And then uh, the gen ed teacher, is also working with a small group over here, differentiating over here. That advanced academic uh, teacher is pulling another group over here and differentiating over there. And what part are they doing independently? So I'm looking for that targeted instruction, different resources they're using. What's the same, what's different? Because it can be thematic. It can be that they're all really studying the same topic, but they're studying it in different ways. You know, there's differentiation going on right now with the PYP exhibition. Um, is anyone a mentor in the room? 
Uh -huh. um, Multiple mentors. <laughs> and uh, when you really think about differentiation, it's happening there too. Right, where uh, Morgan talked about interest, that's a type of differentiation. Sure. So our students are so engaged and so excited about this fifth grade PYP exhibition because they got to decide what they're really going to be looking into and researching. So I'm going to be looking for some of that happening within the classroom as well. Um, it's resources, it's targeting, it's how are you scaffolding up for all? How are you extending the learning? How are you maybe talking about the same topic, but you're going deeper, you're making greater connections. Do you want to add to it, Morgan? What I miss? Turn on your mic. I was going to say it's the depth and breadth at which they access the curriculum. So when when you think about concept based instruction, um, and for example, fifth grade, they're doing an explorer podcast right now at Oak Street, and the kids are accessing, the, they're they're diving deeper in, in exploring that big idea, that concept of explorers. So when we think of explorers, we think of of men in boats discovering new lands. These kids are diving way, way down deep and thinking um, about explorers as as trailblazers um, and redefining that 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 image that we have in our minds. Explorers that are going into space, women in, in technology. That's differentiation, allowing kids to have that um, that big idea, that big idea, that concept-based instruction, instructional model, which is embedded in William and Mary, which is embedded in so many of these great curricular units that we're exposing our teachers to through PD, professional development. And the kids take that, learn a hold of that learning and make it their own at the level at which they can access it. Talk to them a little bit about, for example, Socratic Seminar because I think that's a great example as well. Yeah, um, so Socratic dialogue is a process that you can use in classrooms to access um, higher level questioning where, um, and it, it's very much like a, 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 you sit in a, a circle there, a, a circle like this, and uh, the teacher acts as a, a catalyst for a thought provoking discussion without telling the kids what to say. Um, I like to use the, the um, expression that we have to refuse to be an answer key for students, and that's exactly exactly what Socratic Seminar does. Um, it allows kids to engage in high level critical um, dialogues ra revolving around different topics. It could be a book. Um, we, we just did a professional development at Mount Daniel with some, some very um, wonderful picture books. And the, I use the same books at Oak Street to illustrate Socratic dialogue with kids. So that's another example of differentiation. And Socratic seminar is something where I walk in the room, it's going to be the entire class, right? The entire class was, is going to be in a circle like this. So that's not small group, but that's differentiated because you're provoking that questioning from all of those students. That in itself is one lesson where you're actually differentiated for all, differentiating for all because you're giving every single child an opportunity to learn from everyone else's questioning and to add to it and build on it. But you're also, you're also adding scaffolding kinds of questions in there too. Exactly. And that's another form of differentiation. So if a student is having difficulty accessing the content or concept, you, you can ask a, a, a question that's at a different level to allow them entrance and access to that communication, just like you can take a, a question and really go deep. So what, what Morgan, Morgan and I use similar language, but slightly different um, just in terms of you know, when I think about differentiation, it's by content, process, and product. You can differentiate the content um, based on the level, and we do that all the time with reading, leveled reading books, for example, is all differentiated to meet the needs of our kids. I, I did a reading uh, professional development with um, one of our great reading teachers over at Oak Street, Katie Reardon, yesterday, and she had a whole, you know, folder full of differentiation. You can also uh, so that's content process, you know, just how do you go about it, giving a lot of students voice and choice. And that's really significantly important as part of our IB program, um, just to begin with. So, you know, letting kids find their own pathway to find answers and, and the like. And then, and then product is, you know, what is the actual product that you're going to present? The product outcome has the same level of, of um, depth of understanding but how a student might show it is very different. So uh, it's just a different way of, of providing good differentiation as well. And I think we see that happening all the time in our classrooms. Um, but this, this additional piece of allowing our teachers, not allowing, but supporting our teachers to become you know, advanced academic teachers and getting that credential helps them continue their, their ability to differentiate instruction 
but but really leveling up. And that's been the professional development that that um, Ms. Okutsi has been working on, thank you very much, um, for the last you know six months with us too, is meeting with those those teachers at both Oak Street and at Mount Daniel and, and the PD is actually called leveling up and it's how do you differentiate and scaffold up. So it's probably more than you wanted in terms of an answer. No, that's, that's <laughs> great. And I was gonna add to it because I think what's so important about this is the fact that sometimes with advanced academics instruction, some people think, you know, okay, you know, do we open up the book kind of when some of us were little and is it you know unit one and we move to unit two when we're really enriching instruction when we're really providing advanced academics instruction there's a variety of resources and it's about the thinking that's happening it's the questioning it's so it's just really important that we know that it's not just one process one product one resource yeah. thank you I, oh go ahead i was just i was just going to add um so so we don't miss in in all of this great conversation and the level of detail um and depth that was shared with you all around a differentiation at the root of it and whenever i think about differentiation i think about someone had mentioned earlier by name and need and at the root of it we can't get to to, to true differentiation without the learning and professional development and training of teachers but also making sure teachers have that understanding of what it is their students need. They have to under, truly understand the unique needs of their child or the children that are, that are in front of them. They have to know what their interests are, what their passions are. They have to know what their needs are from an instructional and academic um, standpoint, um, but then also a social emotional um, standpoint. And so when we kind of wrap all of that up we know that it's important and when we talk about true differentiation and rigor and challenging students that our teachers have to be intimate in their understanding um, at a very deep level of what it is that every child needs and it's not always clear and it's and, and it's not always easy um, but at the root of it it gets to the work that we're that we're doing at, at a very um, deep level that the importance of knowing our, our students, not just where they are, but where we want them to be, but understanding those needs and then being equipped to understand the resources and drawing upon those resources, working in a collaborative way um, and getting that proper training and professional development so we know intimately each, each student's need. You asked an instructional question of, instruction, of, of instructional people, and we could talk about this for hours. Well, don't forget, I, I was also a teacher, yes, so you're yeah, really speaking course. my language, but I wanted to make sure that the parents um, who are listening uh, also understood, because it's a word that we throw That's around good. a lot, and, yeah. and like good. I said, I mean, it, to, it is wonderful when it is done well, but I think it's important to highlight, you know, what is really expected by that, um, and if there are, and what the, what, what is reasonable and fair for parents to expect when we say differentiation. So that is that is all very helpful. Um, my last question for, for the moment is, is it, when I think back to what Tiger Paws was <coughs> pre-pandemic, it was almost without the endorsed teacher part, like almost a mini version of this of this model that you're proposing in terms of, of clustering kids. And it was an opportunity during the day where, where different groups of kids were getting what they needed, um, whatever that meant for that group of kids. Um, so is, do you envision Tiger Paws not being a part of the school day anymore in this new model? Or is it, I guess I can stop there. I'm actually having conversations with our team about that because, again, trying to understand what was, what decisions were made, why are we, you know, doing things the way that we are and can we look at doing it better? I'm in the middle of having conversations right now. I do still see a need for Tiger Paws because it is a way that we're able to schedule out some further differentiation for interventions and enrichment. Exactly what it will look like, I'm not sure because I'm having those conversations right now. I have my own ideas, but I wanna value everyone else's ideas because I do understand that within 30 minutes, um, we wanna look at you know, the impact of transitioning from class to class and making sure that we're spending more of that time actually with instruction. Um, I've thrown out some ideas um, that would um, that would lessen the impact of that transition, such as partnering up class uh, teachers 
you know, during tiger paws so that it's just um, trading out across two classes and then assisting them in differentiating to provide those interventions. That's a thought. So we're in the middle of those conversations, uh, but I would like to improve upon our current use of tiger paws. That's great. And that's, you know, way on the operation side of, the side of things. And you guys are the expert with that. I only ask because it's so detailed in our in our 2020 local plan that I know we're looking towards the new local plan. And I was just curious um, if that would be language that would be used in, in the new local plan. Maybe I'm getting too far ahead of ourselves. Um, you know, I'm not sure, yeah. but I do. But I do know that time for intervention and enrichment is always going to be necessary in any school whether you uh, carve it out and it's called a separate 30 and it's a separate 30 minutes and you call it tiger paws, I don't really care what we call it. Intervention and enrichment needs to take place at every school and every grade level. Um, so that definitely needs to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Uh, Vice Chair Gould, did you have some questions and comments? Um, no, I, and I, echoing, I appreciate the time, the energy, the effort to, to come and talk about this. I know this has been uh, a, a topic that we, we've we explored before, um, and given the number of changes, it's great to have this kind of transparency, and especially the enthusiasm, um, which is always helpful. Um, and I, Dr. and I appreciate your comments as well and the acknowledgments in the beginning. I think that helps set the tone um, for the conversation tonight and also <clears throat> going forward as well, because I think we still... Um, you know, w with any kind of change, it's not just going to happen in one night. So I appreciate you setting the tone for how we're going to navigate this. Um, a couple points. One is, you know, you know I, I, again, I, I, if you look at a textbook of what differentiation would be to be successful, it, it, you all hit every single checkbox. You know, you talked about professional development. You talked about teacher buy-in. You talked about curriculum that is not just, you know, adding extra worksheets, but targeted and aligned with uh, differentiation. And unfortunately, differentiation in education is usually a term that is thrown in many other districts, and it's not implemented with fidelity. In fact, it's, it's not implemented at all, but it's a term that's, and so you're up against, uh, you know, the misnomer of differentiation. But I, I would say that um, how you all describe how this is going to be happening, um, it, it doesn't seem like any stone was unturned in terms of how you're approaching differentiation. Um, so that's great, and I'm excited about that. Um, the the uh, the the one issue, uh, Dr. New, just question for you about equality and equity, and I think that's where some of the community has been concerned by, not just from um, the changes that have happened, but also changes that are happening in our surrounding districts and across the country around the concept that to be successful for delivering uh, higher rigor or higher expectations or higher challenge, however you want to define that, that every student gets the same kind of services. And there's, you know, th there's been a push in some cases where honors classes are being reduced or taken away. So every kid experiences the same class, the same. What's your thoughts on that? Um, what's your, how would you address that in the terms of equity is equality, which, which I think a lot of people in this community would have concerns by? Yeah, I'd, they're not the same, first and foremost. Um, equity is, and I think we've, we've sort of defined it here, is by uh, unapologetically giving every student um, what they need when they need it. Um, particularly those students that have been traditionally marginalized for one reason or another, um, not by their own doing. Um, so when you look at um, some of our marginalized populations here in the city of Falls Church or in surrounding jurisdictions, they have systematically been um, uh, denied access to programs like advanced academics or um, clubs and activities. And so to me, equity is providing um, equal access to, or equitable access, if you will, to um, everything that we have to offer to make sure that every student has the opportunity to be successful. And then to provide the appropriate support to make that happen. So we have kids that may have traditionally um, struggled um, and been kept out of a program because they were struggling and never were given access. And I'm, I'm suggesting that we provide that access and then also scaffold up to allow that student to be successful. And I think that what we're talking about here is providing equitable access to our advanced academic curriculum and materials. I'm not saying it's equality because it's not, it's, it's about equity and providing every student the opportunity to have the materials and resources that every other student has and then provide them with the necessary means to achieve that goal. Okay. Thank you. 
That makes sense. Yeah, and I think the the, the level of depth that you all described, differentiation, that doesn't that, that clearly is is against the concern that some have raised that everyone would have the same kind of services at the same time. So I think that's a great, I appreciate it. It's actually the, yeah, it's the opposite yeah. of that. Right, It's, it's exactly. about giving every student what they need in the moment that they need it. Yeah, no, I, th I appreciate that. Um, the, the, the last point I, I, I would make, and it's just, it's more about the, how we kind of got here. And I think Dr. Noonan, again, provided a great opportunity for us to, to try to get back on the same page. But I do want to acknowledge that in our community, how we operate our schools, clearly we have the school board we have the district, the staff, um, we have our, our parents, and we have our students. Um, and, and so those four often have to work in conjunction. And, I, um, and our parents are represented by our committees, and that's the, 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 the bodies of organization that we have. Um, and I think the, I would encourage us to ensure that our GEAC community, uh, committee is still at the table and still part of the discussions. Um, and, and still being asked for input and making sure that they're uh, partners in this. And I think where we got to this, and as, as you pointed out, there's been a lot of changes obviously over in the last eight months. Um, and the GEAC committee is probably uh, asking to make sure that they're part of those, uh, you know, during and, and um, not after the fact. And that's, I think we all have to make sure we recognize that with our committees. And I know we're, uh, uh, that will also help because they're, they're a representation of our parents. And so, I just want to make sure that we remind of that and we, we make sure we engage. I think a lot of what you discussed tonight is excellent. Um, and I think there might be some opportunities for engagement with the GEAC committee to make sure that they're abreast of all these changes and they can ask questions. And so they're not just listening to this, uh, you know, from their perspective, it'd be one way since they're not allowed to engage. So I would encourage that opportunity. I'm sure there's going to be opportunities in the future. For and, I, and I'll just address it to say, and I, and I know that our staff representatives are here tonight, um, Peter Weilandman and Julie Macrina, um, and that's precisely why we, we paused bringing the, um, the local plan for the gifted to the board until later in the year so that the GAC would have an opportunity to hear kind of what's going on, provide some feedback and input, because ultimately we want to have a local plan for the gifted that goes forward that matches what we're doing. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to need the GAC to, to support us and, and work together to make that happen. And can you, uh, can you uh, talk about how they will be part of that process, as you just mentioned? Like, what's their, what's their role in that? Yeah, is I that... think, um, well, Andrew, what is our chair of the GEAC, um, who works very closely with Peter Weilandman and Julie Macrina on their um, agenda? And so as we continue the work of Local Plan for the Gifted, I know um, Kareem Doherty often will come to the meeting and, and will probably be there talking about um, sort of the plan going forward and asking for feedback. Okay, so parents, if they have suggestions, they can work obviously with the committee or through the committee. They can, they can either work, work through all. the committee or uh, if parents are not on the committee, probably their best method for getting information is to communicate with the principal of the school Okay, um, who can share with them sort of the plan going forward. Okay, that sounds good. And then my final point, I appreciate, uh, uh, Mr. Bates, I, I appreciate your recognition of the social emotional benefits of uh, advanced academic and, 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 and I mean, differentiation in terms of uh, I, that applies to all students, not just uh, uh, identified students. But there is, I think we all recognize the public comments from a couple of meetings ago where there was a significant amount of support to say this is not just about our kids getting ahead. That's not what this is about. This is about our social emotional benefits that are provided to our students and how they changed, how they engage differently in the school day, how they're, they, are they show up differently at home. Um, and I appreciate you identifying that because I think that gets lost in this discussion around uh, gifted education or advanced academic. Um, I think there is a misnomer about why some parents are advocating for, for uh, differentiated instruction, true differentiated instruction. So I appreciate you raising that and reminding us that that's a critical, important piece of, of the health of our students. Thank you, Vice Chair Gold. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that um, some of the from some of the emails that we've received. I think uh, parents are looking for you know, challenges for their gifted students and also that ability to have peer-to-peer -peer connections with their, um, with their peers that are, are um, similar abilities. And so I think having that cluster achieves that. So that is true. Um, I know Morgan, so you're um, in central office, is that correct? So these, this is two, this would be two positions in Oak Street. 
And do you see these positions as being 100% instructional face-to-face -face with students or like what, what, can you give us sort of a breakdown on that? So the one that will work with small groups, face-to-face -face with those small groups, um, you know, part of the former um, services provided some push in as well. So I would expect the, um, this, addition, this one piece, this one position to also provide some push in. So a lot of small group pull out as well as some pushing in. That's all with students. And then the other person is fa will be face to face with students every other week during enrichment. That's face to face with absolutely every single class at Oak Street. And then the alternating weeks face to face with students in the classroom coaching, modeling, co-teaching, also pulling groups, differentiating. So 100% face-to-face. Now, the way I am looking at the reestablishment, though, of the original position, though, um, that one will also be doing the assessment, you know, obviously the mind, all these great things that we're doing, but that's also face-to-face -face with students as well. So for clarification, too, um, those two positions are separate from um, from Morgan. from Morgan's right. position, so it is. A, it, it really would be a two point five. Right. So it's it's much more than we've had in the past. Right, and that that was sort of <coughs> part of the point I was trying to right. drive home. And, and more, sorry for my ignorance of your position, but are are you also working with gifted across the division? Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, K twelve. Okay, so we have you here focusing, because we're focusing tonight on Oak Street. But Correct, yes. So we may invite you another time to hear about the whole system. That would be so, wonderful. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, and anyone else have any questions? Yes, um, Mr. Dr. Anderson. I just want to echo thanks again for all the work that's been put into this, and it looks like you all put in a lot of thought. Um, and I just had a, a quick question on, you know, as we, uh, as you go about doing all these changes, um, I guess, how are you going to assess whether things are successful or whether they need to change? You know, are you going to be just looking, measuring inputs, looking at outputs? I'm just curious. It's all the above. You have to look at the quantitative as well as the qualitative, right? When we're talking about the socio-emotional, that's qualitative. Are our kids available for learning? Are they all interested in being in school? Are they all happy? Are they engaged? And then the output. Are they producing? Are they learning? Are they able to communicate their learning? Um, so we're going to be looking at all the above. I'm going to be in there evaluating how teachers are um, implementing. I'm also going to be using those observations to see what else do we need to do to uh, our professional development because when we go in, we want to make sure that we're identifying what are all the great things that are happening, what are areas that we can improve upon, and what can we do to support our teachers so we can get there. Did that answer your question or is there something more? Uh, yeah, mostly, mostly. I just, I, I just it's uh, always... When I, whenever I'm kind of planning out things, I always like to think about, okay, well, here is the data that I, that I have, whether it be qualitative or quantitative, and then looking down the road, it's like, when am I going to assess it? How, how is it going to be assessed? Um, and so I'm sure you have all that. Another kind of, piece I really want to yeah. look at, too. <laughs> um, I do know we need to go home eventually, but I could talk all night. Um, so when we look at those portfolios as well, that we're going to have the teacher, the additional uh, teacher collecting, my hope is also, quite frankly, that we're going to have enough evidence and we're going to have enough access to this rigorous instruction that we may end up identifying more students for gifted services. So that's part of the measure as well. And, and if I may, uh, so we talked about the qualitative and quantitative. I think two important quantitative pieces that we need to look at is one, um, the model that um, provides support in a pathway for additional teachers to reach that gifted um, endorsement or po possibly certification. So we're looking at from day one to you know, whatever that marker is down the road, how many additional teachers have we um, been able to support in that? And then the other is we have to look at our identification process and the results um, that it yields. Are more students um, being able to access are more students of color being able to access um, based upon their um, time with teachers who have been trained, um, who have received a level of training that they had not previously received? Um, what, are the, what are the performance impacts on those students who may or may not have been gifted um, as, I mean, identified as gifted, but we know they're getting that exposure to the levels of rigor as well as that support and that differentiation. And so I appreciate the question because those types of questions have to push us to look at um, assessment and accountability. And absolutely, 
we want to look at um, identification and increases as well as those performance metrics. And that may actually be more of a longitudinal look too, as we see kids move into Henderson and the high school. How many of our students of, of color are accessing our, our advanced academic courses at the secondary campus, as an example, because they've had more exposure to, um, to the, the differentiated scaffolded instruction for advanced academics. Yes, Ms. I just wanted to add a quick note on that same topic that I know that this has come up at GIAC meetings also. Um, and just historically, there's also been a lot of, of bias and prejudice in identification for gifted services, right? I mean, that's a that's a, uh, obvious. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest both in, and staff have been talking about it. I think we have some wonderful staff who are very invested in looking at ways to um, to look at our identification process and see what, what can and should be changed um, to make sure that we are reducing those biases and, and, and making sure that all kids who deserve to be in our programs are, can, can be. Um, so I'm assuming that that would be part of the conversation later this spring when we look at the local plan and changes to identification would be part of the general plan. Because identification generally happens, the first identif wave happens at Mount Daniel, right? So it's not, didn't come up tonight because it's not specifically in Oak Street. Piece. But we have recently had to take corrective action based on some feedback from the state. Um, and so we are looking at a, a broader um, way of identifying kids um, going forward. Great. That's great. And I, I do think we have the right people in place in this room and elsewhere in the community to make sure that we that we really do the best we can with that. Thank you, Ms. Tess. Ms. Silverman. I have another budget question. Do we need to review the line item on salaries? Because is this going to affect the salaries next year or is it the year after? It won't impact salary file next year um, because it's the one time only um, funding. No. I'm, I'm sorry, for um, a, a teacher increase in pay oh. for getting the professional development oh. and the, getting the certificate. Yeah, we go ahead. We, so teachers, when they earn additional graduates credits can move up and shift pay lanes. So it's really going to depend on how many credits teachers have and when they reach that next threshold, right? So if they currently have a master's degree, when do they get the master's plus 30 credits? Um, so we typically have funding set aside each year to adjust when teachers receive a higher level of education. So my assumption is this will just flow into that. And it's something that we would normally expect. It may happen a little bit sooner with the support from FCCPS, but we should be able to manage it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Well, this has been a really informative presentation. I think, you know, I know that this board has publicly said many times that we definitely uh, support extending all these resources to all of our students. But at the same time, as we talked about equity, making sure that our, our students who need that academic challenge also have that. So I think this has been a great uh, presentation. It's really helped inform uh, us as to the direction of, of Oak Street's academic uh, Ms. Tyson. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to say this earlier that Jess Goodwin is also co-chair of the GX. So oh, I wanted to sorry. thank her for her. No, it's yep. new this year. She was she added she came on board to help Ann. Sorry, so Jess, if you're watching. Her, she's also she the PTA president. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that's fine. Uh, so anyway, so th thank you again because this has been really informative. I think you know part of I think where and you acknowledge this, Dr. Noonan, was some of those communication pieces early on, and this is things before you, you probably even read you know, re even be, even became here, came here. And so I think one of the things that um, we notice uh, the community notices is, is communication is a big piece of it. And so this has been, I hope that our community will watch this presentation. I think it's really informative and very clear and it's really helped us understand better what, wh where we're going. So thank you both very much for that. And Dr. Nguyen, thank you again for your putting everything in context. I think that was really also helpful setting us up for this conversation this evening. So, and thanks to the team. Yes, thank you both. And I'm sorry that we didn't, those in the audience and <laughs> weren't called upon, but thank you for joining us this evening and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on now to and this was usually the star of the show is Ms. Michael at this meeting. So we'll, we'll turn the spotlight back over to her here. Uh, we are now at 3.01 FY24 budget questions and answers. And I think I'll just, can I shoot it directly to Ms. Michael or would you like uh, you to- You can, I, I'm just gonna sort of set it up to yes, say that, um, 
you know, uh, what we'll do tonight is kind of what we've done the last several nights is we'll go question by question. And if there are any questions about the question or the answer, let us know. Otherwise, we'll just kind of um, keep moving through the questions. So, Ms. Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity to review the budget questions. The first new question this evening is number 25, state support cap. Um, this question was submitted by Dr. Ortiz. Um, and in this response, what we did is we gave a history of the support cap um, that was provided to us by the Virginia Association of School Superintendents. So it provides the description and then talks about the impact statewide um, to the support cap being previously eliminated. Are there any questions on number 25? No, thank you so much, Ms. Michael. Of course. All right, question number 26 um, was about the counselor and psychologist position that were funded through ARPA funding from the general government. Um, and it talked about what were the impacts of those two positions. Are there any questions on the psychologist and counselor? Okay, question number 27 was regarding the reading coach position um, that had previously been requested by Mount Daniel in FY21 and FY22. Are there any Questions on that? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I thought uh, it seems like I might made a, made a bring my budget forward. Well, um, it seems like I, I made a mistake. I swear I saw that it was one of the unfunded items for the FY24. That's not the case. I don't believe so, but I can quick look at that chart. Here, can we just? Uh... Oh, you are oh. right that there is a reading coach position on the unfunded list for FY24. And I think I can take a stab at that. Um, okay. Katie Reardon, who is our reading coach, splits her time between Oak Street and Mount Daniel. And I think that the um, advocacy was to add one more so there'd be a full-time person at Oak Street and a full-time person at Mount Daniel. But we just didn't have the resources to fund a full-time person at each school um, right away. Since they've already got somebody else that's also helping with some reading there. Can, can I follow up on that, Dr. Ortiz, and then jump in? Um, so. Are the reading specialist and reading coach do different things? So they're really the same thing. Okay. Um, we have a reading teacher um, who sometimes is called a reading coach or a reading specialist, um, but both Mount Daniel and Oak Street each have a one and a half position, right? Before we used to have um, less than that, we only had one, but then when second grade was moved, we increased it to one and a half at each school. Um, and they are sharing that half a position. Um, I don't believe it was filled last year um, in terms of difficulty hiring, but this year they are sharing a staff person. So they each each school has a 1.5 yes. reading specialist coach, whatever. And then they have, there's another 0.5 that goes between the two schools. No, they each have 1.5. Okay. And they both want to have 2.0, which would mean a 0.5 at each school, which is that 1.0 that's on the Okay. I, I think sharing a position brings challenges in terms of coordination of schedule and those components, right? So we, we certainly, you know, recognize that impact in terms of sharing the person. Okay. Dr. Tisa, did you want to follow up on that? Uh, no, I, I appreciate you considering the question. I think, um, you know, I think it seems like, it seems like a, a pertinent request. I think maybe, I, I don't know enough about the reading program and the challenges. I just noticed that it was a kind of a recurring request. Sure. You know, so perhaps um, as we start thinking about the budget for the following year, we can we can um, hear from the, the schools about um, these requests and what they think are, are, are really necessary. And in, in your budget books, just as a reminder, the, the rationale for the request is, is written by the school. Yeah. Um, and we, um, we'd we like to keep this on our radar too, particularly with some of the changes at the state level around um, the implementation of reading programs across the Commonwealth, although we are in good shape and we're um, currently implementing two programs that are on that list, um, it is a heavy lift for, for our reading folks. All right, so perhaps if, if we, you know, we get to the stage later this spring or, or in the summer when we get to some carryover and things like that, maybe we can have this, we can renew this discussion. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Question number 28 is on the college and career specialist and the contract length. Um, any questions on the college and career specialist contract link? Okay. Question number 29 um, is on the sports medicine program um, that's offered at the high school and student interest in the number of sections that we teach. Yeah, so I think the only <laughs> comment I had here is that I really appreciate the detailed answer. I think the, the and, and I think I had, a, I had a couple of questions that were similar in nature. 
on the, in this. And so what, what I'm hearing is that exactly how we move forward with various academic positions are going to be a result of, we'll, we'll consider that as we get the results of the salary study and, and, um, and then decide on the, on, the, on the most effective path forward. And, and I'll just add to that, it's salary study, and that will take care of part of this. The other part that will be taken care of, we hope, is that, um, you know, we have, for round numbers, let's just say 900 students at the high school, it's a little less than that, um, and a defined number of elective programs. And these elective programs sort of fight for students, unfortunately, and it becomes a zero-sum game in some ways. So as one program loses students and students come to, for example, sports uh, medicine, um, the staffing from that program that's losing it will shift over to sports medicine and then this program would lose some staffing. So it's challenging um, if you're an elective teacher, um, but we, that's the way we do our, our staffing in the system. Okay, yeah, that's understood. I think, I think all I can do then is advocate for the next, um, you know, the, 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 the next multi-use development to come into place and help out a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Shop local. <laughs> <laughs> Question number 30 was regarding our before and after school programs that are funded with CARES Act ESSER funding. Were there any questions about question number 30? Oh, yes, I struggled. Uh, can you talk about the, this sounds like a great program for especially, you know, in terms of the, the learning loss that we've all uh, talked about and continue to talk about. Um, what is the funding uh, projections for after this next year for this type of program? So this funding we have expended, we will have fully expended it this school year. Um, and then we would reassess the need, but this um, federal funding was expected to be time limited. Time limited. Okay. Okay. Um, and do we know, do you know offhand the enrollment? of these of the the two programs or maybe they just the, oh, the oak street program or i don't we, i don't know how okay. many people are in the oak street program but i'm certainly happy to check with our instructional staff to find out okay because this obviously this would be something we might want to try to continue for our budget for a following year given the uh yeah given the, the targeted needs so thanks uh-huh Question number 31 was regarding the Oak Street entrance um, and our ability to add a secure vestibule and an ADA access. Um, we provided information in the answer about um, the state funding that's coming and we're also awaiting uh, the final state budget to see if we receive additional funding from Senator Saslow. So Ms. Michael, if we don't receive that, we can still find the resources elsewhere? Or? So we're currently working right now, that first pot of money, the $1.2 million is funding from the state specifically to address um, security. And we are currently working on that funding. Um, Jim Wise, who's a purchasing agent at the general government is in the middle of that RFP process. So we're fully moving forward as if that's the funding that we have. Then depending on what happens to the state budget, we'll either expand what we're doing and, and do more and enhance it, or we will try to move forward and expend this first set of money from the state. When the final RFP bids come in, um, we'll know if this state funding will fully cover that cost or if we need to come back and ask for additional funding. I see, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Tice. Uh, I just had a quick follow up question with that. Um, I know that the Special Education Advisory Committee was really excited about this because yes. of course it really improves our ADA um, access. And um, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but if you had to guess the timeline for for this, what would, what would you guess? So we've really, really been pushing the purchasing agent at the general government because we would really like to put the ADA access in this summer. This summer. That's really oh, wow. critical, but I don't know that we'll get there. It's gonna depend on the vendor who gets selected, right? Right. Their ability to do it. Um, but and it's would something we have that we- the whole other school year? Or? I hope not. My hope is depending on the timing and what needs to be done, that we could do some pieces over um, places where we have gaps in time, where if we're using concrete, it could cure mm -hmm. and other components. Sure. And we really just need to think through how can we do it in a way that doesn't in any way endanger students, but allows us to get it done as soon as we can. Right, so I would you, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I, I just don't wanna be a broken record here. I just wanna make sure everybody understands that there is ADA access sure. at Oak Street. Yes, I just said it would improve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 yes, right. I know a, it would yes. improve, um, um, but just to make sure that we're on the record to exactly. say that there is ADA access, um, it's just on the other side. So would you feel comfortable and saying that that some version of this would be done in the next year? That's my hope. I won't know where we're at with the RFP process is we've went through and all of the pre-qualifications for bidders has been complete. Right. Now the RFP will go out and we're going to ask for bids back in a month. So at that point, I'll have a general idea both in terms of the cost and potential timeframes, okay. right? So 
hopefully we'll have an update for the board okay. shortly. That's faster than I was even hoping. So I know these things take so long. So thank you. They do, but we, we'd really, really like to get this done. It'd be a great enhancement to the building. For some yes. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Uh, Ms. Silverman. You just mentioned um, that it would be the ADA piece of it would be hopefully this summer. It, would that also include the security festival, which, you know, as everybody knows, you have to walk into Oak Street before you even see the security guard. And it would be great to have that separated out. It would. We'd really like to, to get them to do the whole project over the summer because that's when it's least disruptive. Um, but again, once we have the final um, vendor selected, then we could look at both the time frame and the cost. Okay. I'm super excited. The pre-qualified bidders um, have done previous work like this, which is a great, a great sign. So my, my hope is that, you know, they're super skilled and done this before and we can do this in a timely manner, but part of it's going to depend on their schedule availability. As sure. Well. But you envision when you had mentioned ADA upgrades, you're in, you're envisioning this to happen simultaneously for Correct. both pieces. Correct. Okay. I just want to manage expectations a little bit. Sure. I appreciate your uh, enthusiasm, Ms. Michael, and your optimism. I, I just, I'm not sure. Um, so I want to make sure that Debbie we all- Debbie Downer. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I really am, but I know that there's a whole design process that goes on and then there are some issues with, there's still supply chain issues and things like that. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful too. I'm optimistic, but I- Well, we, you know, I, I, this has been one of my sort of things since sorry. I've gotten on the board. So we're much further ahead than we were a couple years ago. So we're, we're getting there. So thank, thank you both and thank yeah. you for managing No, no, I appreciate your realism. <laughs> my goal is to push this vendor as hard as we can. Absolutely. So, thank you. Anyone yeah. else, anything else on this question? Okay, thank you, Ms. Michael. Question number 32 um, is regarding special education expenditures. Um, so we've provided an answer that looks both at the budget and the actual expenditures and then talks about our budget development methodology. Any questions on this? I just wanna say thank you. Um, so uh, just to clarify, so when you're uh, producing uh, FY24, um, you're basically looking at the staffing at the beginning of FY23 to kind of project out to FY24? Okay. That's uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, so when I was looking at the, at the numbers, I was just like, oh, you know, you know we have, you know, uh, the, uh, the budgeted for 23 is at, say, for the instructional wages at uh, Meridian High School is, you know, about $750,000. And then next year it's going to be budgeted for a million dollars. I'm just like, oh, what's, what's going to change about, you know, special ed at, uh, you know, Meridian with, uh, you know, $250,000 extra in, uh, uh, you know, uh, instructional wages. Um, that, that seems like it you know, gets, you know, at least a couple of uh, more uh, sped, sped, sped positions. So, I'm, so it's still, you know, so, yeah. Is yes. it, so I'm, I'm still curious about it, but we can, we can talk about it later. So though. any new positions that would be added for next year would be in the budget document in the proposed budget expenditure adjustments chart. That's where we walk through every single incremental change from last year to this year. Um, overall, we didn't change the staffing for next year, so this would be a realignment across sites. So for example, what you see in terms of that increase at the high school at Meridian for next mm -hmm. year is offset by a decrease at Mary Ellen Henderson. Mm -hmm. So that's just some shifting of people between the buildings, um, but no overall change. Okay. Um, and is that due to just an increase? So the students shifting from one school to the next and there's uh, kind of a, a flow of uh, special ed students going from one school to the next? Just that's exactly okay. what we do. And so that's based on the previous year's um, staffing. And so what it, what happened is we had that really large class. Mm -hmm. Remember that came a few yeah. years ago out of yeah, Oak Street. Well, those are freshmen now, right? They're freshmen yeah. now. Yeah. So yeah. we had to send up a teacher from um, Maryland Henderson up to Meridian. And then, you know, we also just in terms of staffing, we do look at those positions as, you know, division wide and we have to look at where the need is. And so we always sit down at the end of the year, we do projections based on, uh, you know, our eligibilities and our IEPs, and then we shift staff where they need to go to meet the needs of kids. So that was the last new budget question response. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions before we move into this heavy action oriented part of the agenda? Okay. 
All right, we are at uh, 4.01. And so Dr. Noonan, do you want me to just go through this and ask for motions and? Yeah, okay. I, I think um, at this point, we've, we've done a number of work sessions about these. Um, we've had public comment um, and we're asking that you uh, approve these as presented and um, then we can move on from there. Okay. So if we can start, we're now at 4.01 FY23 budget amendment and appropriation change. If I could have a motion. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I move that the Falls Church City School Board authorize an expenditure and corresponding revenue increase of $3,039,710.69 to fund the following items. HVAC replacement at Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School, two electric buses, flooring replacement at Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School, stormwater maintenance at Oak Street Elementary, interactive display board to preschool, elementary and middle school, miscellaneous operating carryover and collective bargaining. Thank you, Ms. Lerman. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. We're now at 4.02 FY23 pandemic related budget amendment and appropriation change. If I could have a motion, please. Yes, Dr. Anderson. I move that the Falls Church City School Board authorize an expenditure and corresponding revenue increase of 987000 $348 to utilize federal pandemic funding for student support positions and programs. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Silverman. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> and by the way, I'm still hesitating because you know we had Greg Anderson. So it's like my mind is still like, am I saying the right? <laughs> so anyway, but congratulations on your first one. He, he's growing up. <laughs> um, okay, so there is um, one typo in this next motion I noticed. So wh whoever reads it, um, I don't want to bother you with it, Marty, but whoever reads it, it's line two where it says playground improvements that should say at Jesse Thackeray Preschool. So when you just read it. All right, uh, Vice Chair Gold, do you want to read that motion? Yeah, move that the Falls Church City School Board authorize an operating fund expenditure and corresponding revenue increase of $237,286 for the following items. Playground improvements at Jesse Thackeray Preschool, responsive classroom training for pre-K two through five teaching staff, baseball field improvements, <laughs> <laughs> flagpole for softball and baseball fields at Meridian High School, local school activity fund software replacement, scanners for remote deposit and demographer, and that the Falls Church City School Board authorize a community services fund expenditure and corresponding revenue increase of $196,501 for tennis court lighting. Thank you, Vice Chair Cool. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Tice. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Great, motion carries. We're now at 4.04, approval of submission to city manager of FY24 operating budget. If I could have a motion, please. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I move that the school board approve the submission to the city manager, the FY 2024 advertised operating fund budget in the amount of $60,549,417, which requires a city appropriation of $48,582,907 plus 50% of any additional general government tax revenue above the budget guidance of 4.2% on December 12, 2022, as detailed in the superintendent's proposed budget with the following modifications. Increase the advanced academic teacher position at Oak Street Elementary School funded with one-time funding from a 0 0.5 FTE to a 1.0 FTE by reducing the one-time funding by tech of textbooks by $50,000. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. May I have a second? Thank you, Dr. Anderson. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Great, motion carries, thank you. We're at 4.05, approval of submission to city manager of FY24 food service budget. If I could have a motion, Ms. Tice. I move that the school board approve for submission to the city manager, the FY2024 advertised food service budget in the amount of $1,382,794 as detailed in the superintendent's proposed budget. Thank you, may I have a second? Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you, motion carries. And we're at our final um, item, 4.06, approval of submission to city manager of FY24 community services budget. Uh, yes, Vice, uh, Dr. Ortiz. I move that the school board approve for submission to the city manager the fiscal year 2024 advertised community services fund budget in the amount of 
$1,700, requiring a total city appropriation of $107,500 as detailed in the superintendent's proposed budget. Thank you. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Tice. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Okay, motion carries. And uh, congratulations, we've got a budget. So this this now becomes our budget. And so, uh, <laughs> so Peter's gonna go put up his feet, or sorry, Dr. Noonan's gonna go put up his feet now. And But on a serious note, we um, will, um, and Dr. Anderson uh, is being new, we have a thing called, we call budget buddies, where we pair everyone up with the city council members. So we're gonna, um, Vice Regal and I will get that get your pairings up to you soon, and we'll have you know ask you to start talking to your city council um, cohorts over there and um, answering any questions they might have. Uh, Dr. Noonan and I present the budget to the city council in a few weeks. I think you have that on your calendars. Uh, so, anything else that you wanted to add, Dr. Noonan or Ms. Michael? Uh, no, I just want to congratulate um, all of you on getting to uh, a budget. Um, we appreciate all the input and all the questions that you asked. I think that. You know, asking 31 budget questions is a good opportunity for us to kind of keep the dialogue going and making sure that we're responsive to your needs. I do want to take a second to thank Michelle Kopic, our director of budget, who has burned the midnight oil um, on doing a lot with this budget. And also want to thank Kristen Michael, our chief operating officer, who also has done a lot. We're still, we still got a ways to go before we're home. Um, you know, we, we're hopeful. Um, we have hopes um, that based on some of the information that has been shared in the in the media about um, assessed values that the percentage of transfer might actually go up from what we anticipated it would be and if it does then we'll have some um, further discussion to uh, uh, at, at a final adoption about how how that money will be spent mm -hmm. and we've got some work to do still with the um, the salary study and how that's all going to play out too so Got, still got a lot of work ahead of us, but good job so, so far. And quick question. So this, if, thank you, just remind me. So the salary study, we would have that before. So the final adoptions in May, right? correct? So you, we would have that in April, right? We currently have okay. a presentation on the calendar for April 18th from Siegel, um, and they will come and share um, their findings. And, and we're, we're seeing some good things um, already in some of our data, just in terms of being fairly within market, um, particularly with our teaching faculty. There are some things and modifications that we would like to make based on the information that we have, um, but we haven't gotten to the operational side of the house or the administrative side of the house. And I think that's where we're gonna see some some bigger gaps we're gonna have to deal with. So um, we'll also bring a plan for how we, we hope to deal with it over the course of the next couple of years. Okay, and then that, and then we modify, just to remind the public, then we would modify that before that final vote in, in May. Right, okay. we'll do a budget, yeah a budget adjustment okay. and then uh, adopt the final. Okay. And that'll be based on the night before because the night before the city council will adopt their budget, which okay. incorporates your budget. Right, right. <laughs> well, thank you for the reminder of the timeline and, and Ms. Kopic and Ms. Michael, thank you as always. I, um, not, not, we're not popping the champagne yet. We'll wait for till May, but uh, you know, you all have, you do so much work behind the scenes that is not always, you know, it's not glamorous, and but that's you are really the reason why we're able to be informed about the budget. We can ask questions. You really help us understand the budget. I mean, we'll never know it obviously as well as you two do, but we just really appreciate the time and effort that you put into it. So thank you for all of your work. And any other, yeah, Ms. Silverman, oh, I thought you were gonna add something, okay. Any other questions or comments before we close out for the evening? Okay, well, thank you and thank you to all the staff for being here this evening and we're adjourned.